Thank you. Good morning, everyone. You know, you have to wait for the people that are online. You've got to wait for that to happen and, and come on. We are so glad that you're here and that you're spending your July 4th weekend with us and worshiping with us today. Would you stand with us? And let's sing together. All the earth will sing your praises. This morning is taken from Psalm 33, 12 through 19. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven, the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. The songs that we're singing this morning deal with praising the Lord and giving him all the honor and glory that is due his name. This next one, we're going to join together in singing, Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Let's sing it together. See his wounds, his hands and feet. 
God's people said. This, this next song we want to lead you through is one that's kind of new to us. I think we've only done it two or three times since we've uh, uh, been, uh, well, since, since we've been doing it two or three times. That doesn't make any sense, but you know what I meant. Um, especially on a weekend like this, and especially with what I'm going to be sharing with you later, trying to do my best to, to bring both a, a patriotic message, but one that speaks to our hearts as individuals, as Americans here in the America that we find ourselves in. This one here is just a surrendering of saying that the actual battle, because don't you feel like you're in a battle at times? I mean, you just one look at the media and you think it's us against them all the time. And you're like, well, the battle doesn't belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. And it's just got some great words. I love the chorus that we're going to repeat over and over again that says, so when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh, God, the battle belongs to you. And boy, sometimes you just need to be reminded of that again and again. This battle doesn't belong to me. You know, uh, I think of the Old Testament with Jehoshaphat and how he was outnumbered, outgunned. Well, there weren't guns. Outsorted or whatever. And uh, God said, don't worry about it. Just, just go. In fact, when you go, just sing. I'll take care of the rest. And God set up ambushes against the, uh, uh, the Amalekites and just wiped them out. And uh, all they did was head forth and sing. And so... Uh, May this be the battle cry for us as uh, American evangelicals today, that when we fight, we fight not with words or with some sort of a letter we write to the editor. We fight on our knees with our hands lifted high saying, oh God, the battle belongs to you. Let's sing it together. When all I see is the battle
may be seated. Chuck's going to come and share our uh, scripture lesson with us this morning, and uh, it's, I hope it was worth a walk. It's a real short one, but boy, it's a powerful one. Listen as Chuck shares the word of God with us. This is from Proverbs 14.34. It's a very powerful statement. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You might be thinking, how in the world is the pastor going to preach from just such a short little passage? Well, I'm not, but I do believe that God's going to share a few things with you through me or in spite of me, one way or the other. Uh, God's been uh, working on my heart all this week over that passage of Scripture. Just a short little phrase, but boy, it's got some powerful things for us. But before we go, um, we're going to work our way into a time of prayer together. And uh, uh, this next song talks about uh, uh, Jesus making the darkness tremble. You know, we, we say that the battle belongs to the Lord, and I'm going to fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. But we've all been there. When you're in the midst of fighting the battle with, on your knees and you think, okay, God, you got one eye open looking around going, you do have this, right, God? You do have this. And yet the name of Jesus, darkness trembles. It's a wonderful song to remind us that, that he brings, like the first verse, peace. He brings it all, all the storms around us, he brings to peace in our lives when we trust in him. Uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah said, uh, you know, uh, he will bring you into perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. And so that's what the song's about. So we're going to uh, sing it together, and the altar's open. If you'd like to come, we're going to have a word of prayer afterwards. I will give you a little bit of a heads up that Josiah's with us here today, and this is his last Sunday with us before he's off, uh, uh, off to the military, and we want to have a word of prayer for him. So at the end, while I'm praying, uh, at the end of this song, he's just going to kind of make his way down at some point in time, right here in front of the, uh, uh, the communion table, and I know that family and friends are going to come and lay hands on him and pray over him. I'm going to pray over him. But if you're a veteran here today, um, I would love if you would take the opportunity to come up and lay hands on him as well. You, of all people, know what he's walking into. You've been there. You've done that. Uh, whether it was in a time of peace or a time of war, as a veteran, you, you know where he's off to and what he's going to have to do. And so uh, I know it would... Uh, it would touch Josiah, Josiah's heart as well as his family if you veterans in the, in the midst would come and especially lay hands on him and pray over him during that time. So would you stand with us? Let's sing this song together and uh, then we'll have a good season of prayer together as well.
fathers, it, it is true that in the darkest times of our lives, you're there for us, and uh, you make the darkness itself tremble. Uh, there is no other name given to man by which we must be saved, the book of Acts It comes with Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And Father, we're so grateful uh, that you're with us here, where two or more are gathered in your name. Your spirit is with us. And uh, Father, we want to just worship you and want to lift you up. Father, I know that each and every one of us, we walk through the door with all kinds of things on our hearts and on our minds that, uh, Father, keep us from being able to focus on who you are and and a time of worship together. And yet, uh, Father, that's hopefully the songs that we sing and the the time that we spend with God's people and and sitting next to each other or standing next to each other in the pews here and and, and finding corporate worship together uh, begins to take our mind off from whatever it is that we might be troubled with and give us a focus on who you are. Oh, praise the name of the Lord Most High, no matter what may be the situation. I I said earlier, God, about that Jehoshaphat guy from the Old Testament, and and, and his song was, praise ye the Lord, his mercy endures forever and ever. That was his song that he sang over and over again. Oh, praise the name of the Lord Most High. And so, Father, that's what we want to do here today. I know there are a lot of things that are in our hearts and minds. Some of the things that are just coming to the the pastor's mind right this moment is that there's a bunch of us up at family camp, and we just pray that you would be with them, and uh, you'd give them a good week, and and that they would learn together from God's Word, and they would enjoy the fellowship that they have in that particular uh, uh, way of things, you know, up at camp and such. And we just ask that you would be with our pastor, Pastor Jake, as he's going to be heading up this afternoon, spending the whole week there. Uh, working with the teenagers in the family camp program, and then turn around the next week and working with teen camp, and a lot of our kids are going to that, and, and he's a part of the direction of that as well. And so we just pray for your anointing presence upon him, giving him strength and wisdom and the things that he needs in order to be able to accomplish the next couple of weeks up to camp, uh, working for you and for your honor and glory. And uh, Uh, Father, we've got folks at the altar and various things that are on their hearts and minds, procedures that are coming up and such that we just want to lead them in your capable hands. You're the great physician. You've got this, Father, and we're so grateful that you do. And so, Father, whatever may be weighing on our hearts or minds, will we just relinquish it to the Lordship of Jesus Christ today and allow you uh, to uh, work your will and your way in each and one of those situations? And we'll give you all the honor and glory. This is to your name. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, if I could have Josiah and the gang come on up, I'd appreciate it. You may be seated. If you're not coming forward, that'd be fine. Right there, my friend. Come right there in the middle. I'll back up a little bit get you in there. Thank you, veterans, for coming forward. I, I know some of you, not all of you, but <laughs> catching you. Anyone else who wants to pray with them again, do as well. Let's have a season of prayer together. Father God, I I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to uh, watch watch this young man grow. I remember when dad came into Bible study on a Thursday night one time and quoted that scripture from Psalms where, uh, blessed is the man who's got a full quiver load. He was looking at his fourth boy, fourth J boy. I remember when that happened, and now here we are laying hands upon this young man to send him off to serve his country. And Father, I'm grateful uh, that he has chosen this and that he feels this is God's calling on his life and where he should go. And we just pray your anointing and your, uh, your presence over him, that, uh, Father, he would make great decisions, that he would follow your lead, that, uh, uh, Father, he would be a light in the darkness in the places where he finds himself, and that he would be God's grace and God's mercy, as well as, well, God's victorious right hand, too, because the military has to share its might to every once in a while. And we, we thank you for that. And so, Father, would you just guide and direct him in all his ways? Would you keep him safe, Father? Would you uh, keep his witness intact? And, Father, we look forward to hearing uh, from mom and dad and family members and from him as well uh, when, he, uh, uh, when he steps back into Bentley Creek to share where he's been and what's been going on. We just pray that, Father, you would use him in a mighty way in the places that you're going to take him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you, folks.
give people an opportunity to make their way back into uh, their seats there. I'm going to turn off the little blue lights so they don't flash and drive the ADD crazy. Um, so we're in the book of Proverbs. For those of you who may be uh, 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 visiting with us here, uh, uh, we're in the book of Proverbs in a series called Some Are Wise and Some Are Not. And uh, we're looking at a lot of different, uh, uh, a lot of different ones, really powerful uh, proverbs that talk, you know, wonderful things. And others like, you know, go to the ant, you sluggard. We're, we're looking at all the different ones along the way, about 12 weeks worth of just finding ourselves in the book of Proverbs and seeing the wisdoms that, that's there. And as I was preparing, I knew this was July 4th weekend, and so you were thinking, okay, what, what do I have to share uh, as far as a patriotic kind of a message? And the book of Proverbs, this is what I was running into. A lot of it, it has, it has a lot to say about folly and foolishness, which is a term which seems to accurately describe our nation as of late. Wouldn't you agree? It just seems like we're being very foolish on some of the things. Consider some of the issues that are dominating the news right now. And I, I'm not a political guy. I, I don't know where you stand on either of these. I just listen to the, the debates that are going on going, wow, we just... We can't seem to get our minds wrapped around things. Like this one here, we can't, or more like we won't, define what a woman is. There's been a lot of that going on. We don't know what she is, but we certainly want to make sure she's got all the rights to choose whatever she wants. Could you please define who she is, at least? You know, we, we struggle with this. Or how about this one? We, we want to make the claim that a six-year-old is capable of deciding their own gender, or even younger as well as making life-altering decisions with their physical bodies. However, those same children are not, and I quote from our government, they're not emotionally or mentally capable of consuming alcohol or owning a firearm until they're 21. And some of them can't rent a car until they're 25, yet you'll give them their own at 16. I have no idea what's going on in America. It just seems to be a little crazy. You hear them talking, you're like, do you hear yourselves? This is foolishness. What are we talking about? Or how about this one? It doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. It doesn't, all right? We demand that people accept the decisions that are coming down from the highest court in our land. That is, unless you disagree with the ruling, and then the chief justices are just out of touch elitists who ought to be replaced. The conservatives, we felt like that a few months ago when they were making decisions we didn't like. Oh, they're just terrible. We need to get rid of them. Now that they're making decisions we like, we're like, we love them. And the other side's going, ah, oh, they're terrible. Get rid of them. Oh, my goodness. We're just back and forth. We, nobody can make up their mind. Nobody can. Like I said, we, we, we seem to be looking more and more like a nation of fools. It's embarrassing. Absolutely embarrassing. Consider some of these gems from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man acts out of knowledge, but a fool exposes his folly. That sounds familiar. Proverbs 17, 12. Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his folly. Proverbs 18, 13. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Proverbs 26, 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. And probably my personal favorite would be Proverbs 26, 11. As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. But we see that over and over again. Foolishness, it seems to be the defining attribute of these United States of America. And I mean, consider some of these. These are kind of silly, foolish facts, but they're happening in America today. Only in America do we buy hot dogs in packages of 10 and hot dog buns in packages of 8. Nobody can figure that out? I mean, what is wrong with our nation? I, I, th that's just stupid. You know, that's foolish. Now we have two extra, oh, golly, for crying out loud. Or how about this one? Only in America do we make the sick and the infirmed go to the far back of the, uh, of the CVS to get their drugs. But you can buy the cigarettes at the front counter. Why don't you put those in the back? Then the people, why do you got these cigarettes all in the back? So that you'll quit. I mean, you know, whatever. Why do we put that all the way in the back? Only in America. Only in America can you buy double cheeseburgers and large fries, and then you order a Diet Coke with it. Uh, yeah, okay, oh, fine. Uh, apparently, it negates the rest of it. Only in America, this is, my, this is my favorite pet peeve. Only in America do we leave our cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway, and we keep our junk in the garage. I said that in the 8 o'clock service, and I got death stares from like four people. And I thought, hey, you know, if the shoe fits, I'm sorry, but you're <laughs> That is a really nice car you own and keep out in the driveway. You know, like, but that's all my junk. I have to keep it. You're like, wow, all right. However, here it is. 
I, I really thought that's why I was going to be preaching. Something on foolishness or folly. Because it just seems like we're, we're being foolish nowadays. We, we're acting like fools when we should be acting like a, like a world power. We should be acting like a country that is one nation under God. That's what we should be doing. Yet we act the fool. However, the phrase that really hit me was when I came across this one that Chuck read for us. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. It doesn't say anything about folly. All foolishness aside, as a nation, we have made some decisions that, of late that are outright disgraceful. We're craziness. And I just think, wow, that's a powerful phrase. I couldn't get it off my mind. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my country. But boy, there's a major difference between celebrating diversity and celebrating debauchery. And we as a nation can't seem to remember what the difference is between them. And we get confused with it. I talk to people, good people, solid, who I would consider Christian people, who when you get talking when you're like, what in the world are you saying? That doesn't make any sense. There are three things I want to share with you from this poignant little proverb. Two of my points are going to come directly from the passage, which you're thinking, man, that wasn't very long. Two different, distinctly different phrases in there. And then my, my last point, I, I want to just conclude with a, with a statement in regards to this proverb as a whole. So let's get started. Let me get into this with you. The first one, I, you need to see, any nation acknowledging God is a nation blessed. Any nation, not just America. I, I think sometimes we, we're very myopic that way. It's like, well, only America gets blessed. By, no, any nation who acknowledges God is a blessed nation. Check out the phrase, righteousness exalts a nation. There are two terms that we need to define in that statement. They are righteousness and exalted, right? Righteousness is the act of right living or living according to God's holy standard. Righteousness has nothing to do with the little mottos that we as Americans love to have. It's on our coins, and we say it in the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, in God we trust. One nation under God. It's not about those little platitudes. Righteousness has everything to do with actually operating like we uh, are under God, uh, living our lives like we're trusting in Him. A righteous nation is one that is defined by its godly character, and conduct, not only at home, but abroad. And there's a good chance that Josiah is going to be going abroad in some of the things that he's going to be doing. But it's our conduct and our character abroad as well. A righteous nation is one that not only does good by its own people, cares for its own veterans, shelters its own homeless, feeds its own children, but it's also a benevolent benefactor to the poor and the oppressed outside its borders. We take care of people. A nation devoted to righteousness is one that protects the unborn, upholds justice, and treats everyone with dignity, regardless of who they are or what they stand for. We treat people with dignity. Solomon says that a nation like that is exalted. It's blessed. Exalted in the eyes of man and in the eyes of God. A couple weeks ago, in a message entitled Directives from Dad, so it must have been a couple weeks ago on Father's Day when I, when I preached this particular one, I shared from Proverbs chapter 3. Check out, check out Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Uh, this verse tells of a person of love and faithfulness and how they'll have a good reputation, not only with God, but with man. Check this out. It says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. A righteous nation is one that honors God. And because they do, God honors, blesses, and uses that nation uh, for His glory to transform the world. We used to do that a lot more than we're doing it today. I'm not picking on America. I love my country. I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. I'm, I, I honestly mean that. I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. But we used to do it a lot more than we're doing it today. A lot more. We, we were the place that people looked at and said, that's a great country who comes in and helps us out and takes care of their own. We're not doing that as much as we used to. Righteousness exalts a nation. Any nation acknowledging God is a nation that is blessed by God. However, number two, any nation abandoning God is a nation cursed. Here's the other half of the proverb. Sin is a disgrace to any people. It don't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're American or you're Canadian or you're Mexican or you're Croatian or you live in the United, uh, 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 you live over there in, in, in the Soviet Union or you, I don't even know what it's called anymore. There's so many of them over there. I'm not sure exactly what I'm saying, but over there, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Any nation, any people, 
sin is a disgrace to them. So the question that needs to be asked is this. What if, what if a nation decides it doesn't want to follow God, but rather do its own thing, uh, uh, live its own way, or, or make up its own rules? What if a nation effectively abandons their belief and therefore their reliance upon God? Then what? What? Well, let's define terms again. There are a couple of them in here. Sin is the first one we see. Sin is a willful transgression of a known law of God. That's great theological terminology for you. I've heard it called this way too. Sin is a willful missing of the mark. Think of it this way. Imagine that you're an expert marksman in archery. You can hit the bullseye at a 50 yards, practically blindfolded. Your muscle memory with, with your draw and your aim is spot on. I mean, you just, you've done it so much that you pick up that bow, you grab that arrow, and you loose it, and it hits every single time. You're just that good at it. However, for whatever insane reason, you choose to loose your arrow and deliberately miss the target altogether. It wasn't a mistake. No, no, no. no. It wasn't an accident. Nobody bumped you or anything. You just decided you weren't going to hit that. You're going to fire it elsewhere. You meant to miss it. Sin is exactly that. I know what God expects of me. I know what is right. I simply choose not to do it. I simply choose, for whatever reason it may be, to do what I want to do, not what God would have me do. That's sin. It's not a mistake. It's not a falling short in some way because we happen to be imperfect. Boy, I don't know how many times you hear Christians say, well, pastor, I'm not perfect. No, no, I know you're not perfect. I know we fall short. I know we intend to do something real well. There's a lot of times I aim at stuff and I don't hit it. Amen? You been there? I've seen some of you people hunt in the fall. Come on. Come on. Oh, it was moving. I, I hit a tree. I, uh, there's a lot of times we, we purpose to hit something and then we're disappointed when we don't. That's falling short. I wasn't that great. It was moving too fast. Whatever. But come on, let's be honest. There are times when we deliberately weren't planning on hitting the mark in this area. That's a blatant disregard for a moral law of God, typically packaged in the excuse of convenience or pride or greed or just plain selfishness. We just decide, I don't want to do that. In the case of abortion, boy, you can wrap up the arguments up in any type of justification that you want. And people have been doing it. Oh, my, the social media is just crazy right now, all over the place, trying to define what that decision was and what it means for us, and this is it, and I'm going to give you this illustration. That When you all boil it down, it really doesn't matter. Killing the unborn is sin, period, end of story. You can define all you want to, but killing the unborn, that's a sin. The Bible speaks against that. Children are a blessing from the Lord. We don't do stuff like that. Or consider sexual immorality. And I don't mean the one you're thinking of. Because the second you say sexual immorality, you start thinking of Noah's flag, and you start thinking of them, and you're like, oh, it's got to be the... No! Sexual immorality, sexual immorality, in all its forms. It doesn't matter. The Bible defines one man, one woman, get married, there it is. Boom, there it is. Ta-da! Anything else. I met a, a wonderful couple the other day, having a great conversation with them, and then you found out that they're, they're not married and they're living together. And you're like... That's sexual immorality. That's, that's, that's contrary to what God would have, have for you. And it's like, oh, and then they argued with me and came up with different... No, sexual immorality in all its forms, it, it's sin. No matter how you package it, how you spin it, or how you celebrate it, it's sin. But love, love these people. We, we don't, many of us have to do life with them, right? I mean, we do. But that's what that is. And Solomon tells us that sin is a disgrace to any people. A disgrace. Wow. It's a reproach, a blot, a blemish, a pollution. Sin corrupts the character of a nation, destroying its reputation, as well as its ability to effective, uh, affect positive change in its surroundings. When Israel was following the Lord, they were a positive influence on the nations around them. When Israel was sinning, they were a curse. When Israel was following the Lord, they found success in all their endeavors. When Israel sinned, they invited disaster upon themselves. Read the book. It's amazing. We've been in that immerse uh, beginnings and kingdoms. We've been reading through the, the Old Testament together on our Thursday nights. And, oh, it's amazing. When they were on, they were on. When they were off, it was bad. It was just bad. No wonder the psalmist declared, and, and uh, 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 Kendra started it off, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Yeah, we love that verse. But quietly cringe at the fact that the opposite would also be true, right? Cursed is the nation whose God isn't the Lord. Ooh. And yet Solomon declared, sin is a disgrace to any people. Any nation abandoning God is a nation cursed. So, so where do we go from here? That's it. There's no more to that verse. So try this on. Number three, the type of American you are 
will determine the type of America this is. Let me explain. The question would be, where do you fall within the scope of this proverb? Let's face it, it's easy to complain, isn't it? <laughs> We're all good at that. It's easy to blame everyone else for the condition of our country. I mean, it's Biden's fault. And if you don't believe that, then you're thinking that Trump did it. He messed it up, you, you know, years ago, and, and now Biden's trying to fix it. Well, I don't, I, yeah, you, you, you believe what you want to believe. Some people just think it's Pelosi. That's her. She's the, she's the mess. If you're in Pennsylvania, we think Wolf did it. If you're up in uh, New York, I don't even know how to say her name. Hoku, Hukum, Hukum. I'm not a New Yorker, so I don't know, I, I don't know the new girl's name, you know. Yeah, whatever her name is, we blame her. That's what we love to do. We go to our leadership, we say, it's their fault. But I ask you, where do you, where do you personally fall within the scope of this particular proverb? Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness exalts a couple. Righteousness exalts a family. Righteousness exalts a church, a community, uh, a state, a nation. But sin is a disgrace to any people. It's easy to compare ourselves to others and claim that we hold the moral high ground when upon inspection of our own lives, we discover that we ourselves are not truly surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. It's easy to cry out to the Lord on behalf of our nation and yet be individuals who have forgotten where we came from and, and, and how we got here. I think America's done that a bit. We've kind of forgotten who we were. Uh, we've, we're, we're 200 some odd years old, 260 some odd years old or something like that. We've kind of forgotten who we are and where we came from. That, that's what happened to the children of Israel, and the Lord even warned them through Moses about it. Check this out. I think I put it in your notes, Deuteronomy 8. You can look it up later. I'll read you some of it. But in Deuteronomy 8, Moses told the Israelites, tell me this don't sound like America. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Well, that certainly sounds like the America I remember, right? Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, purple mountains, majesty. I'm not sure why they were purple. Probably the sun above the fruited plains. But wait, Moses kept going in verse 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I'm giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and you're satisfied when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's a scary passage when you kind of take it and say, God, has America been doing that? Did, have we gotten prosperous and then forgotten who we are and where we came from and who got us here? You can't tell me, church, as the United States of America as a whole has forgotten who we are and where we came from and who gave us all this. Hmm. And the scariest part of it is verse 19. Listen to this. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Church as a nation, we have most definitely forgotten the Lord. However, my question for you is, as an American Christian, have you, you know, the type of American you are will determine the type of America this is. We need to remember that our character counts, that our conduct counts. It's so easy to look at what those guys in Washington or those guys in Harrisburg or those guys in Albany are doing and say, see, they're not doing it right, and not look at our own selves and say, wait a minute, my character counts, my conduct counts. We are either part of the problem or we're part of the solution. There's no middle ground when it comes to righteousness. As Al Denson wrote, he, he wrote this, In a world full of broken dreams where the truth is hard to find, for every promise that is kept, there are many left behind. Though it seems that nobody cares, it still matters what you do. Because there's a difference you can make. But the choice is up to you. The type of American you are will determine the type of America this is. So what can you do this very day to turn the tide in America? You know, we always talk about your vote counts. It does. You know, I'm not telling you not to vote, but you know what counts more? Your character, your conduct, how you 
behave as a Christian, how you represent the Lord Jesus Christ is just as important, way more important than going to the poll. But your vote does count. And I know, the second I say, what can, you, what can we do to turn the tide? I, I guarantee you, if I was to say that in a Bible study, there'd be one person go, oh, I know, we should pray 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Uh, no. No, it's a great verse, but no. How about each of us try examining our own hearts and lives first? How about each of us start praying what David prayed in Psalm 139? Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way or wicked way in in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. It starts with me. It starts with my character and my conduct. Because Second Chronicles 7.14 is not for the heathen of our nation. It's for those who claim to be followers of Christ. As you read it, listen. If my people who are called by my name, that would be you and me. If my people who are called by my name, that, that's you and me as believers. If we will humble ourselves and pray and seek God's face, and turn from our wicked ways. If we repent of our sins, the sins of bitterness or apathy or selfishness or whatever, then will God hear from heaven and will forgive our sins and heal our land. See, the spiritual restoration of our country must begin with you and I, the followers of Christ, who are willing to rededicate our lives each and every day to His Lordship. It's up to us to re recommit ourselves each and every day to seeing His kingdom come. His, isn't that the Lord's Prayer? Isn't that worse? Some people pray it every day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth or in my country or in my state or in my family or in my marriage. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in whatever relationship as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of our hearts. May we never forget that righteousness exalts a nation or a family or a couple or a church. But sin, it's a disgrace to any people. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I, not the happiest, not the happiest of, of patriotic messages, but it hasn't really been a happy time in our country. It's been filled with a lot of uproar. And it's easy to complain. It's easy to look at things and to point fingers. And yet, Father, I pray that you would help us to, just take a moment and take a step back and point the finger inward and say, God, I want to be who you've called me to be. I want to be surrendered to your lordship. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's anything wicked or offensive about me. And then lead me in your way. Lead me in the way everlasting. Let me start there. Father, help me to understand that my conduct, my character in this world counts. My conduct and my character with my spouse, with my kid, with my church family, with my Sunday school class or life group class, with my community, with my state, with my nation. It counts how I live. And Father, I pray that you would help us to understand that and make whatever changes need to be made, that, you would, that we would allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in us making us the American Christians that you need for the next phase of what you're doing uh, here in America. Uh, Father, I love my country, and I don't want to see it destroyed because of sin. I want to see us restored through the power of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, would you begin a work in me? Would you begin a work in us, I pray, that we might be the people that you have called us to be, and through the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, Father, be agents of change, agents of mercy and compassion to the people we come in contact with, showing them that God so loved the world that He gave you, that no one would perish, no one would be destroyed, but all would come to belief and repentance in the Lord. I thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in and around and through us today uh, through obedience to your word. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Kendra shared with you Psalm 33, like 12 all the way to 19. Great passage of Scripture. Here's the last two verses of that chapter. I'll leave it as, your, uh, as our benediction before uh, Roger comes. It says, after all that, blesses the nation whose God is the Lord, and put your faith and trust in God. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him, 
our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. And here's the last line. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our trust in you. God bless you. Roger. Good morning. I notice there's quite a few less people. I uh, know there's a lot of vacations going on. And of course, right now the uh, camp is going on from the 1st to the 10th. And with that being said, uh, Pastor Jake asked me to remind you that there is no youth group uh, for this, this week because he will be up there. After today, he's going up to uh, family camp. Also, uh, mention, as I look down through there, the uh, food pantry is on the 7th, July 7th, 10 a.m., and so is for Smiles also July 11th, but also on July 11th at 2 o'clock, there's going to be a uh, Burlington Campus Service, which is a ministry to the residents of the Bradford County Manor, and you're invited and welcome to join with that. Also, uh, Children's Church and Youth Snacks are needed. It's in the bulletin there. Uh, you can sign up on the yellow clipboard for the Children's Church or the blue clipboard for the uh, Youth Snacks. And with that, enjoy this wonderful day. You're dismissed.